15 ноября на культурном форуме в Санкт-Петербурге я, среди всего прочего, давала интервью шведской газете «Светска Дагбладет» ежедневной шведской газете, с которой я до этого пару раз уже общалась. Но в этот раз на культурный форум приехала их корреспондентка, которую я до этого не знала, которая, как я потом выяснила, в России до этого не работала. Она мне брала интервью. Хотела меня спрашивать про внешнюю политику, но я, поскольку про внешнюю политику не рассказываю, то я рассказывала про общественное мнение в России и его трансформации. В общем, то, про что я всем рассказываю. Я себя, как правильно делать в таких случаях, записывала на телефон. Говорили мы с ней по-английски. Газета, соответственно, шведская. Через некоторое время э, выходит это мое интервью с фотографией. Вот что точно хорошо получилось. Дальше там будет все плохо. Предупреждаю, как это спойлер. Но фотография получилась отличная. А, но она там под поеволом. Я ей пишу, что пришлите мне текст. Э, и пока я все это пишу, выходит русский перевод на ресурсе и на СМИ. А там такое что просто кровь стынет в жилах. При этом, э, в общем, там ужас какой-то, <смех> кровавый мрак. Но а сквозь этот кровавый мрак можно смутно угадать, поскольку я-то знаю, что я говорю, а смутно можно угадать какие-то очертания того, о чем я рассказываю, но подкрученное до степени полного идиотизма. Вот такой так залихватской чушь, такой широким таким мазком, вот правой рукой махнет улица, левой махнет переулочек, все приблизительно неправда, и, и так лихо очень при этом. А, я получаю этот самый шведский текст. Теплится во мне где-то надежда, что ресурсы на СМИ, которые у своей политической аффилиации, он что-то там развеселил в переводе. Может быть, в оригинале, думаю я, там не так все ужасно. Отправляю добрым людям, знающим шведский язык, делают мне перевод. Нет, и на СМИ не виноваты. У них перевод отличный, адекватный. Ужас там весь в оригинале. Что делают в таких случаях люди, я на самом деле не знаю. Ну, не судиться же мне с ними в самом деле. А поэтому я... Хочу вывесить эту аудиозапись для того, чтобы, во-первых, все могли послушать мои чрезвычайно умные мысли на английском языке, во-вторых, чтобы можно было сравнить это с тем, что в результате из этого вышло. Я там не одна, лишь очень пострадавшая. Она также интервьюировала Ольгу Голодец, вице-премьера, про которую там написано, что это единственная типа женщина в России или вообще человек в России, который возражал Путину и не был за это отправлен в трудовые лагеря Сибири. Трудовые лагеря Сибири. Вот так вот тяжело живет с вице-премьером. Ты только скажешь чем-то не то, сразу трудовой лагерь. А, но, в общем, не знаю, как, как Ольга Голодец на это все реагирует, а мне радости от этого чрезвычайно мало. Потому что, конечно, в жизни всякого публичного спикера бывают такие <laughs> неприятные минуты, когда говоришь одно, а печатают бог знает что вообще. Мораль отсюда на самом деле одна. Нужно обязательно э, свои цитаты перед публикацией проверять. Когда об этом заявляешь в публичном пространстве, журналисты всегда очень обижаются и говорят, мы никогда не согласовываем цитат со спикерами. Никогда. Вот как записали, так мы и напишем. На самом деле, а если их попросить предварительно вежливо, добрым словом и пистолетом, то они все присылают цитаты на согласование, потому что СМИ нужны спикеры, а не наоборот. Фраза, характерная своей грамматической туманностью. Кто здесь кому нужен? Можно разбирать в зависимости от падежного окончания. Тем не менее, все все присылают. С этой тетенькой мы тоже об этом договорились, но она мне ничего не прислала. Потому что если бы она прислала мне по-английски, например, я бы, наверное, разглядела, что там какая-то прорастает какая-то хтонь сквозь мои вот эти вот все эм, чрезвычайно непростые высказывания. Потому что мы говорим о сложных вещах. Общественное мнение – сложный концепт. Э, некоторые социологи вообще считают, что его не существует как, так сказать, единого понятия. Поэтому там всегда с одной стороны, но с другой стороны, и, и все, в общем, не очевидно. Из этого делать какие-то лозунги для демонстрации, не соответствующие действительности, нехорошо, неправильно. А когда я была молодым, неопытным спикером, уже, наверное, года 4-5, в общем, несколько лет тому назад, я еще не знала этого золотого правила относительно э, выверения цитат. И я помню, что одно медиа из Казани, не будем показывать пальцем, брало мне интервью по телефону. И потом его опубликовало, безо всяких, соответственно, предварительных правок с моей стороны. И там было две вещи изумительные. Во-первых, я им сказала, что по данным Росстата до 30% экономического оборота находится в серой зоне, то есть проходит мимо государственного контроля. Они написали 70%. 70% экономического оборота у нас находится в серой зоне. Так и живем. Ну что, ладно. Хотя это тоже было не весело. А, кроме того, они спросили меня о повышении пенсионного возраста, о котором тогда уже речь шла, и, в общем, было уже ясно, что это в какое-то время произойдет. Я уже не помню задним числом, я от ужаса забыла, что я на самом деле им сказала. Но вышла там фраза следующая. Я там говорю, я говорю. 
Я не понимаю, почему люди так болезненно к этому относятся. Им ведь всего лишь придется дольше работать. Фраза, достойная гауляйтера. Вот кто вообще может такое сказать? Я не понимаю, почему люди волнуются. Им всего лишь придется на несколько лет больше поработать. Какой-то кошмар. С тех пор я стала большая и умная. И всегда прошу мне присылать мои фразы. Я обычно говорю так, что вот если вы это будете использовать, то, что я вам говорила, для своего собственного понимания ситуации или проблемы, или того вопроса, с которым вы, собственно, ко мне пришли, то это со мной согласовывать не надо. Я не прошу вас весь текст. Но вот то, что с моей фамилией, то вы, пожалуйста, мне пришлите. Потому что, знаете, какие бывают вещи? Фамилию неправильно пишут, часто бывает. Должности какие-то приписывают фантастически. Мало ли чего. Надо перепроверять. И дальше я тоже планирую вести себя так же. И всем, кто имеет дело с медиа, советую. Дело не в том, что кто-то злонамеренный. Хотя в этом случае... Не хочется, конечно, никого ни в чем подозревать, но такое ощущение, что у корреспондента был некий свой уже э, заготовленный ответ на все вопросы, под которые надо было подогнать все сказанное. А если оно не подгонялось, то мы вот топором. Простым шведским топором. Не надо так делать. Не будьте такими. Особенно, когда вы имеете дело с непростыми проблемами. Все, что касается России, все непросто. General power for the president, uh, for the decision makers, uh, foreign policy is all that matters, mm. and that they forget mm. uh, those issues that are important for the people themselves. Mm. It is uh, part of the more general dissatisfaction with the current mode of communication between the people and the powers. Mm. Uh, there is a demand for a new communication model, mm. for uh, a more level dialogue. For less vertical transmission mm. uh, of information, uh, whenever there happens a protest episode in Russia, we always hear the same phrase from the people. They didn't even ask us. Mm. They made a decision. They decided that, for example, this house is to go, this park is to be replaced by a church, or the other way around. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't even ask our opinion. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. they haven't consulted yeah. with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, At the same time, uh, in within the decision-making structure, within the political uh, system, the idea is that people protest because they want to get something. Yeah. They haven't had enough. So we need to give them something, then they'll be quiet. Yeah. It is much more difficult to perceive that people want a new model of relationship. Mm. That they are dissatisfied not because they have something has been taken away from them mm. or not given enough, mm -hmm. but because they are opinion and their interest has not been consulted. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, the demand in the language of political science, this is the demand for political participation, yeah. for participation in uh, decision-making process. And this is the basic political demand. This is the root of all politics. Mm -hmm. Those who have their interests consulted, they have the power. Mm. So this is extremely political, and it is very hard to adapt to uh, for the political model built on absolutely different rails. And when you said before that people are worried that there's going to be an out, outright war, what does that mean? What are people worried about? What kind of war are we talking about? It is on the list of fears. Mm. When we see, when we look at the uh, again uh, sociological um, results, uh, asking people what they fear, of course the, the top three will be uh, health problems for, for oneself or family, uh, loss of job, uh, poverty. But uh, in the first, I would say five, we would have uh, war, mm. uh, crime and even higher than crime, uh, aggression or oppression on the part of the state. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people are afraid, yeah. uh, not exactly, again, if we, if we uh, interpret this data correctly, I would say that people are not afraid of some other country attacking Russia, but they are afraid of their own powers embroiling them in a conflict of violence, mm -hmm. as well as they're afraid mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the, uh, for example, the, the law enforcement turning mm -hmm. against them. They're afraid of police violence. They're afraid to become victims of a uh, falsified uh, criminal cause, yeah. which, is, which is a very rational fear, yeah. unlike like, the fear of the next world uh, war. Uh, and this constant fear has been kept 
uh, afoot by, of course, state media. And people are very tired of it. Mm -hmm. Another mm -hmm. big process that is going on in Russia mm. uh, for the last, I would say, two years mm. is the diminishing audience of state TV, diminishing trust, and uh, increasing age of this audience. So we have three things happening simultaneously, which doesn't happen every day. Uh, first, people actually watch TV less. Second, those who watch trust it less than they used to. And third, those who watch it are aging more fast than the society in general. Yeah. We are an aging society in our own right. Yeah. The uh, medium age of Russian citizen is currently this year, in 2017, it was um, uh, 39.9 and now it's 40. So the, the yeah. medium Russian citizen is 40 years old and, and she's a woman, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Again, yeah. if we talk about statistics. Yeah. Uh, she has uh, 1.8 kids, lives in a city, uh, owns a car uh, produced in Russia. Uh, her name is Yelena Smirnova. Again, this is statistics. <laughs> but how, for example, then I want to come back to how the Russians, they worry too about, you know, a war, not that Russia would, but the world, they would somehow, Russia would somehow provoke there would be a war, out, all out war. But how is the view of the people of what Russia has done in Syria and lately in Turkey. You know. So far as we can see, uh, neither Russia nor Turkey are very much on the radar mm. of the general public in mm. Russia. Uh, Turkey was uh, a big topic because uh, it was a major holiday destination. And when the flights were stopped, it was, uh, of course, perceived by the people as a great nuisance. But then uh, the communication was resumed, so people are now able to uh, fly to, to Turkey for, for their holidays. And yeah. so now, they, they, in their minds, the situation has been resolved. Syria is very far away. Uh, there is the idea, we see it on focus groups, that uh, people think that we spend too much money there. Uh, and that, that is about it. Well, really. And then the way that, that, uh, that Russia has helped, you know, Assad basically to win the war, how is that seen? Is it seen like something, this is good because, uh, uh, you know, I'm the sorry, alternative I, I, would be worse? I don't think that people care about it or know very much Assad's name. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah. So I, I can't, honestly, I, I can I tell you that there is this or that position. Yeah, the, yeah, mo yeah. the most uh, competent answer would be that they just don't care. Again, really? let me repeat, they cared about Turkey and Egypt because during one of the previous episodes uh, with the uh, terrorist um, uh, action on Sinai, uh, there was also a stoppage of flights. Yes. That was what mattered. Yeah, it touches uh, people. Yeah, it touches people. That's this okay, is, yeah. You see, this is, this is what, what public opinion is, yeah, is about. Yeah. It has its own uh, information yeah. field. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly uh, what you can actually, what touches your life, your daily life. And the U.S., what's the perception of the U.S.? Ah, well, uh, U.S. is conflated with the general West yes. in this big picture of public opinion. Uh, so it's them, hmm. actually. That's why uh, when we saw this upward trend in attitudes towards other countries, hmm. it affected the uh, United States as well. Uh, there is the idea that it's the dominant country in the world and that it's behind everything that happens around the globe. Mm. That is a kind of global power that orchestrates uh, policy changes, regime changes, wars, end of wars, etc. Yeah. Uh, all, all across, all across the, the planet. Uh, generally, uh, Russians have more uh, have better feelings towards Europe than towards the United States. Although I must repeat, they are conflated in this general term, the West. Yeah. Uh, but uh, more people have been to Europe than to America. America is more of a TV picture. Europe yeah. is more of a reality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, so people feel more connection towards mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. Again, one of the most tangible uh, demands that we can figure out from the answers that people give uh, is the demand for better relations with specifically with the European Union and with the more, I would say, integration with the European Union. Mm -hmm. Again, this is so at odds with the actual Russian policy that it may seem fantastic. But uh, when we try to, for example, 
uh, we try to find out what is called proto-party groups. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a kind of uh, political interests that can roughly correspond to parties that do not exist now but may exist at some free yeah. electoral future. So we ask people what slogans mm. uh, they find attractive. Mm. Uh, mm. What do we see in this? Again, this is a very general picture. This is not a political sympathy as such, but mm. it is some kind of some kind of rough map uh, for us. Uh, we see uh, a very big. Uh, excuse, a very big strata of people with uh, left-wing sympathies for social state, for more uh, help towards those who can't help themselves. Yeah. Uh, a kind of socialistic, I would say, not communist, yeah. but but leftist, yeah. leftist sympathies. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the social state, the welfare state. Uh, then we see the second uh, part, uh, the second strata, uh, is the loyalistic core, the mm. party of stability, mm. voting for the powers to be because any changes for the worst. Mm. This is second. Mm. Mm. And then we see the party that we would call, again, in normal environment, we would call it a liberal pro-European party that says that we need uh, ad to adopt more European standards, we need better relations with uh, Europe, uh, and we need more uh, political freedoms inside the country. This is the party of the urban population. Mm. Although almost all Russian population is urban, 74.4% uh, of our compatriots live in cities and towns. Oh, really? We are mm. no longer an agrarian uh, city. And this mm. is an, an ongoing mm. process. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, be behind sure. those, again, clouds, Australia, we see the nationalistic uh, demand, Russia for Russians, we see that. We see a smaller uh, party, quasi-party of traditional orthodox values, 5-7%. Mm. We see, by the way, bigger than that, about 10% of the so-called Russian libertarians, uh, less state, more economic freedom, yeah. lower taxes, Liberal. no state involvement, yeah. the, the laissez-faire state. Right. Again, we see nothing of this kind on a public political scene, but there is a demand. So whenever we have even slightly freer yeah. uh, political environment, you see all those proto parties erupting as actual parties. That's interesting, but it's still, but people still perceive the country as not as a democracy. And not uh, as an autocracy, is it that? But how do well, people view the country? Well, uh, the uh, the terms mean uh, different things for different people. So mm. we we won't get any sense from asking mm. uh, questions like, uh, is Russia yeah. a democracy? Yeah. What we ask instead, or rather what sociologists ask and, and we analyze, is this, for example, uh, what, uh, what sentence do you agree more with? Uh, power needs to be concentrated in one hand, on, in, in single hands, or power needs to be distributed between various power bodies. Mm. We ask this question, and we have, uh, well, more or less half and half, with the slight predominance of the distribution of power that has uh, appeared late, mm. lately. This is the latest development. Mm. We have about 45% of people who, uh, who say that power needs to be distributed, mm. who are in favor of checks and balances, again, without mm. naming the term. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and 43% of people who think that power has to be concentrated in order to be effective. So that's, that's how matters stand it's right, right at this moment. How would you describe Putin's role in today's Russia? How, how strong is his position? What do you mean, how strong is his position? How in terms popular, of what? Well, how popular, how much popular support does he have? Ah, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Professor Mark Galeotti, has lately published a book, uh, a small book, uh, you may read it, it's called We Need to Talk About Putin. Uh, and there is a chapter in it that is called Putin is Popular and Not. And this is exactly it is. He's popular. He's the most popular politician in the country. Uh, he has been on the stage for 20 years. Mm. Uh, people have not seen any alternative in the, in the terms of, of their natural life. There are people who've been born under this regime and who are now already uh, voters and workers and taxpayers. Uh, so he's still number one in terms of popularity but this the nature of this popularity has been changing since it has been actually changing since 2011 hmm. 
Uh, then we had these two years of Crimean consolidation and the sky-high popularity. And then we began to perceive the process of erosion. So, he, so when we specifically, when we talk about presidential ratings, what we talk about, there are three types of mm. them. There is the electoral rating. When you ask people, uh, would you vote for this person next Sunday if there were elections? This is the electoral rating. Mm. Then there is the rating of trust. Mm. Uh, it can be asked as a closed question or as an open question. Mm. Uh, whom do you trust mm. among the political figures or do you trust mm. and then you are presented with a list. This is the rating of trust. Uh, and then lastly, there is the rating of approval. Mm. Do you approve of the activity of such and such as in his position? Yeah. Uh, this is by its nature a closed question. Mm. So you have to mm. name names. Mm. So if we look at those three ratings, the highest mm. and the most stable, although also declining, mm. since the, the decline has been since 2018, mm. is the rating of approval. Because as far as we can understand, it's uh, the question is perceived as a kind of uh, reality check. Mm. So there's the president, mm. his name is Putin. You agree to that? Yes. So this is the rating mm. of approval. The lowest is the rating of trust. And it is lowest mm. if you ask the question in the open form, name somebody whom you think is worthy yeah. of your yeah. trust, yeah. then it will be lowest. If you present a person, a respondent with a list, he will more often name the president because it's the most familiar name on the list. Yeah. But this is the lowest of those three ratings. In between is the electoral rating. Mm. Electoral rating is the answer to the question, do you want the current state of things to continue? Mm. And this is also going down. Ah, One other significant detail. Uh, mm. During uh, recent years, we had three most popular public figures. The, the President, the Minister of Defense, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. These were the most popular politicians in Russia. Yeah. Of course, there was the President in front, then there was a great blank space, and then there were those two. Yeah. Those three started declining together, keeping the same proportion of I votes see. They went down, down. together. Mm. So what we have is not the change of attitude towards a person, because you will hear people are tired of the president. That's not the, the whole thing. Mm. Uh, it's not about the person, it's about the agenda. Because of course, those three together, they represent what? Mm. They represent a certain agenda. Mm -hmm. Political greatness, strong power, Russian position abroad as a global player. That's interesting. So that is really the agenda. I think this people... really brings us logically uh, to, in the end of our yeah. uh, interview, to the beginning to your first question. Yeah, so the first question, what you said, and that's so, if I understood you right, people are thinking of feeling that, you know, Russia leadership cares about the approach abroad, the, the role of Russia abroad, they don't really care about what's happening in the country. Is that so? Uh, they, Enough. The, the perception is uh, too much money and resources is spent on foreign adventures, specifically on the military and on defense, not enough on social infrastructure, specifically on healthcare and education. These are the two hot topics. Mm. Uh, and this is also because uh, of the demography. Again, Russia is an aging society, mm. uh, dominated by women. Mm. Mm. Women have children, mm. and they care about mm. it. They don't mm. so much care about winning wars abroad. Uh, and this, the process that is going to continue, because the aging process is continuing. Mm. Mm. We have relatively few uh, young people in the demographic pyramid. There will come more of them in the 20s because we had this period of relatively high birth rates mm -hmm, between mm -hmm. 2004 and 2014. When these people become social mm -hmm. uh, figures, uh, when they become voters, again, taxpayers, protesters, perhaps, uh, parents, workers, etc., we'll, we'll just have more youth component in our social composition. Uh, at this moment, not so much. And do people, are they worried about the sanctions and the thing that, you know, Russia is no longer in the G8 because of Crimea? Is it something that people care about, worry uh, about? Well, the one sanction topic that is on the radars of respondents is um, a food anti-sanctions. 
and these are perceived as being initiated by the West, not the other way around. Talking about realities. Interesting. So that is all, something all that the is other all the other types of sanctions are either unknown or not understood. It's okay. So there is this is uh, this is what people care about. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they yeah. think that the West refused to sell us their food. Their food. Yeah. Yes, that's how they feel. That's the view. And the view on, on, on Trump and the whole impeachment now that's going on. Is that something that is uh, of interest? Or how does the Russians look on that? Because there is a component with, with Ukraine. So it's... Uh, there's not uh, so much interest in Ukraine even uh, recently, talking yeah. about Trump. Again, I'm sorry to, uh, <laughs> to yeah. give such disappointing answers, but no, uh, it's, 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 all a, within, it's all within the, the levels of statistical mistake, statistical progressivity. Yeah, so, so little. We can measure, we can measure, for example, the popularity of Trump. We can. But this will give us just the uh, index of recognizability. Mm. Mm. No, not much no so you can't really say no the way. No, no, no. I understand. You, you no. Can, you, it's, it's more meaningful to measure, for example, the popularity of uh, Lukashenko or Zelensky yeah, in Russia. Yeah, yeah. This may be some kind of marker, but, huh. but not not. not Okay, and then the whole thing about uh, uh, Crimea and so forth, people don't really care and discuss that anymore, it's done. It's done, it's been digested by the Russian consciousness. Uh, we do, we did begin to hear on focus groups uh, people saying uh, Crimea has cost us too much. Mm. But this is in the line of this general idea that we're spanning resources needed for ourselves. Uh, this has been caused by very natural economic reasons, of mm. course. Uh, with the uh, people's real disposable incomes uh, going down for six years, uh, you will uh, begin to be irritated by any item of foreign news. But this yeah. doesn't mean that people are in any way less ready to perceive Crimea as Russian. Again, it has been digested. It's no longer an actual topic of political discussion. Mm. And it has ceased to be perceived as a thing to be grateful about uh, to the powers. So uh, the idea that we need to be forever beholden to the president who has given us this president of Crimea, we, we see it no longer. That's interesting. So it's something, so the, uh, the, the frustration, you might say, from people is more like you're spending all this money on foreign adventures or wars. But doesn't the Russian people also see that in this way, Russia is increasing its role on the world scene as a superpower? Yes, again, uh, but this has already somehow happened to, mm. in, in the public opinion. The yes. idea is that we have already achieved mm. this beautiful new status and now, and these were the perceptions prior to presidential elections, now we, the victors, will come back home and do great things here at home. Because this has been the adverse effect of propaganda. If we are so strong and victorious, then why can't we cope with corruption, and healthcare and education yeah. and uh, why, why are we paying more and more for housing yeah. and, and why are the salaries not going up at all yeah. uh, so how is yeah. this yeah. so there is this clash I and see. how is this explained this is explained yeah. by referring to the late Soviet times like then we're spending everything yeah. on boosting our status yeah. and uh, we have nothing to feed ourselves at home again yeah. this is not a very realistic parallel the no, situation no, no, no. is quite different. No, no. But the perception is, is like this, and it's very dangerous. Yeah. Because, exactly because it's such a well known uh, picture, mm. it impresses itself on the public mind that it's extremely hard to erase, it will stick. Mm, mm. And then, this, if I understood you right, the, a lot of frustration is the focus on Africa. Uh, well, uh, it's this general idea that we are kind of everywhere mm. and we are stretching thin mm. our own resource base in order to... And then there is another factor, mm. the fear and distrust of China. Of course. Uh, Russia is a European country. Uh, as in our vocabulary, European means progressive, uh, desirable and prestigious and uh, Asian means oh, barbaric, dirty and cheap. Mm. Again, this is uh, not uh, no. not very good, you, but, but but it's like that. Perception. So this new friendship with China scares people. The Chinese are perceived as untrustworthy partners, mm. greedy, grasping, uh, willing to cut down our forests and poison our rivers, etc. There is this general idea that the ecological situation in China is worse than in Russia, so they don't care about environment. 
and this is a very hot topic for the city dwellers of Russia. Environment, not climate change, not at all. Interesting. It's it, again, it's not in the agenda, but clean air and water. Uh, the cutting down of a tree usually provokes a kind of reaction you would expect for a political murder. Uh, wow. And the parks are kind of sacred groves for, yeah. for the urban dwellers of Russia. In almost every conflict in the, in the Russian regions, we see this idea they have they have cut down trees. Wow! Wow! Yeah. wow, wow. And that's what worried. There, there was a park here. Now they're building here a multi-storied house. And, and that really upset. Her. Yeah. And then the Chinese relations. So that is something that is developing. Huh? That's something that. You know, people see too that Russia is also turning to a relationship with China. And again, But, again, here this this huge and tragic gap between the perceptions of the elites yeah. and of the uh, and of the people. Yeah. Um, one question, uh, two more questions. I know we're taking so much of your time already, but it's like and the view on Sweden because it's always been the, this. I think Russians view Sweden because in Sweden you always hear about the controversy about the submarines. Basically, and uh, how is the what's the perception? Again, it's extremely hard to discriminate perception towards one country among all the European yeah. countries. But here's something uh, that's talked Russia, about. Russians, Russians are generally fond of the Northern Europe and this this general Scandinavian fashion. Yeah. It yeah. has been global, and it has touched Russia too. Mm. Uh, Scandinavian fashions, <coughs> standards, uh, mm. words. Uh, Hugge. Well, what's the Swedish equivalent for Hugge? For, for, for Hugge. Hugge is Danish, I think. No, Hugge, Hugge is, uh, is Stuga. It's Stuga. Hugge is, uh, you say, in um, uh, you can say Danish or even in Norwegian. In Swedish, it's Stuga. Uh -huh. Everyone it's, has. It's Fika in uh, Fika. Finnish, Finnish yeah. I think. Yeah. It's Fika. Exactly. So every northern country has this, this kind of exactly. uh, <laughs> exactly. uh, this, this kind of, this kind of uh, yeah. notion. So yeah. uh, you, you are in fashion. Yeah. Uh, globally and in Russia as well, and uh, many Russians visit countries of yeah. Northern Europe because it's pretty close. Mm. Uh, so mm. it's, I can say that it's a universally popular destination because, of course, uh, we, we Northern people wish to go somewhere warm, uh, so much more people go to, to Turkey or to Egypt, of course. But uh, still, it is a reality rather than some mm. kind of picture. That's on one uh, side. On the other side, there is the force of propaganda, painting Scandinavian countries in general and Northern Europe, well, Europe in general, as, uh, well, a kind of dangerous land where they take children from the parents for fancy reasons, uh, where they have uh, 28 genders and where they make people change them again, possibly by, by court decree or by police violence, mm -hmm. change men into women, etc., separate families. Uh, there were a number of stories of, uh, for example, Russian citizens falling in uh, difficult situations somewhere in Sweden or in uh, Finland, uh, and then there is a huge noise about it. Mm -hmm. This, of course, Uh, influences uh, perceptions because most people will take their notions from media from where else yeah. should they take them yeah yeah exactly so there's this mixed picture mixed uh, but uh, that, that's interesting and then the Sweden protesting about you know now the Russian submarines in our waters That's something that doesn't reach heard, that. I haven't heard about it. No, it's a Swedish And I'm a pretty po thing, politicized yeah. uh, animal. Exactly. Uh, and last question, just I want you to address the domestic violence because it is uh, a big problem. Uh, you have now here in St. Petersburg a big uh, this uh, issue with a professor who fell into the river with a now uh, with the hands of his student in his bag. Uh, yes, this is pretty. Uh, Impressive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, once you hear about it, you, you can never forget about it. No, uh, yeah. it's uh, in Moika somewhere, close, close yeah. by. Uh, so I hope you you won't be leading excursions to, to this place anytime soon. Uh, although it's certainly memorable. So uh, domestic violence is an issue in Russia as well as in any other country. There is a law known to criminal science that violence, personal violence, physical violence, generally happens not between strangers, but between people who know each other and who are in daily contact with each other. This is a very sad thing, that's why criminologists are such uh, melancholy people and go around with sad faces, but we, when we think about violence, we imagine a kind of maniac springing on us in a dark alley, but violence lives at home. So it's an, it's an universal problem. 
But with the decline of the general levels of violence, we also have a consequential decline in levels of domestic violence. Mm. Although, mm. when we start trying to address this issue, we need to be very clear that we will never do away with it completely. We cannot defeat crime in, t in terms of eliminate the crime. It is a social feature of human society. Mm. It will happen. Mm. So we should not set unrealistic goals before us. It will not make a good public slogan, we can never defeat crime, or every politician promises to defeat crime, but mm. we, mm. The, the social science people, we, we know what we know. Mm. It will be in existence because people who live together get on each other's nerves. Mm. So they will attempt to kill each other. Mm. But what we can do, and setting unrealistic goals is bad because it prevents you from setting realistic goals. Mm. What we can do is two things. Lower a level and change the structure of crime. It applies to crime in general, it applies to domestic violence as mm. well. So we can attempt and achieve lower levels mm. of violence and we can attempt different structure of violence. For example, uh, you have uh, 100 crimes in your society. Uh, in a uh, natural state, it will be 80 murders and 20 robberies. Mm. In a more civilized state, it will be 80 uh, cyber crimes, uh, fishing uh, and robbing your credit card of its money, uh, five uh, violent assaults, uh, one suicide, something. Mm. This is the changing structure. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of domestic violence, it means that we have to focus on prevention. Mm. The one worst features of domestic violence is its tendency to escalate. From very slight things that can't be legislated mm. to murder and suicide in very quick, a few easy steps leads us from here to there. It's escalation. Another feature is latency. Uh, much more crimes are committed than reported. Mm. This is latency. So it's always latency. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Here especially. And a third feature, and this makes prevention and working with this type of crimes difficult, is the closed private nature of family. Mm. You cannot make it totally transparent without mm. infringing on people's rights worse than it is the, the medicine which is worse than the uh, disease. Yeah, sure. So you sure. can't uh, yeah. film uh, people yeah. around the clock. You can't yeah. install cameras, surveillance cameras in the homes. Yeah. You can't, again, uh, you can't make people live in glass houses. So these are the differences. But there is a new law being discussed, no? Because uh, it was criminalized and then it was decriminalized. Uh, and then this is this is the topic for for another another interview. This is all so complicated and uh, depends on such a number of legal details. Now it was not decriminalized. Uh, the situation is like this. I'll try to be very general. Uh, we do not have a law against domestic violence in Russia. We do not have this term in our legal language. Mm -hmm. huh. That's point number one. We do not have, therefore, as a consequence of this, we do not have restriction, uh, restriction orders. We do not have officially supported shelters for victims of domestic violence. I see. What we have is uh, various articles in the criminal code that describe crimes against persons. They apply to all cases, family or non-family. Mm. And we had, uh, we have this article. Uh, 116, 116 in the criminal code, which is called Pabui, beatings, which mean in legal language, uh, infliction of pain without consequences to health. So these are the, well, painful contexts with, that leave no traces uh -huh. to health. Because for uh, graver crimes, we have other uh, mm -hmm. criminal article, uh, criminal code articles. Yeah. yeah. This uh, Article uh, 116 was partly decriminalized, mm. which means that uh, first time offenders mm. were tried not according to criminal code but according to code of administrative offenses. I still think that this was a positive thing to do mm -hmm. because uh, administrative process is much faster mm -hmm. and easier than the criminal process. And what is more important is That's this. Important. In case of this article, mm -hmm. is the so-called article of Chasnava Abvinenia, private, how would you say, 
accusation. So there are articles of public accusation, of private accusation, and of public-private accusation. Mm. Sorry for immersing you in, in Russian legal paraphernalia, but this is important. So this article is the article of private accusation, which means that the victim uh, needs to lodge a... How do you call it? Jalaba. Jalaba. Report. report. Has to lodge a report yeah. and has to follow through in the uh, criminal process. And what is worse here, that she, it's usually she, can stop the process by taking the report back. And seven out of ten do that. That's why police yeah. police doesn't want to, they're scared, uh, they, they think that they have patched things up, uh, whatever. They, ta they take it back. And mm. so the process stops. That's why the police so often refuses to even take mm. this plea. Because yeah. they know that within the next three days, mm. seven out of ten will be, will, will, will be uh, taken back. Yeah. So they don't want to do empty work. In the administrative process, you can do such a thing. Once the process has started, you can stop it by saying, oh, we have already made it up. So that's why I think the criminalization was a good thing. But it's meaningless. Hmm. Or worse than meaningless without the consequent law on domestic violence and that's what we are working on right now hmm. we do not have yet the bill in the parliament but we have a hmm. working group in the upper chamber in the federation council mm -hmm. and we have various declarations from high-ranking russian officials saying that it's a priority like the chair of the federation council said valentina matvienka uh, mm -hmm. when she was re-elected for her third term as a, as a chair uh, in the Federation Council, she said that one of the priorities of the current session will be uh, this legislation of uh, against domestic violence. We expect, we reasonably expect, uh, the bill to be introduced uh, by the end of the year, before oh, okay. the end of the year. Introduced. This year? Introduced. 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 Not adopted. Yeah. Introduced. Then we'll have a whole new story with its discussion, yes, uh, yeah. adoption, three readings, legislative yeah, yeah. process, my per professional norm, love. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I do, actually. Uh, I must say again, from my own uh, professional point of view, the kind of, the kind of public discussion that we have on the subject looks much more like a natural public discussion than anything previously. We have real opposition, we have NGOs on one side, NGOs on the other side, we have officials saying this and officials saying that, so we have some kind of more, again, real talk. Because there are people who are scared of this law, saying that they will take children away from families, uh, they will break up families, uh, we don't need new legislation, everything is already written in the criminal code, and these are arguments. You can actually argue with them. Yeah. Uh, and we have uh, traditionalistically inclined, again, NGOs, we have the position of the uh, church, now the Orthodox Church, so it's all, all quite live and, and, and lively. Now I like that, again, yeah. because it, if, is, if we could have such a discussion in the parliament, that would be a dream come true. But no, uh, not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. But, but we have a public yeah. discussion. And what happened here in St. Petersburg with this professor, what, is that seen as a, uh, one kind of domestic violence? Uh, there was a previous case with a student lodging a plea against him before another student. Uh, she, she also had relationship with him uh, and she said that he has tied her up and then beaten her in, 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 the, in, in, in the home uh, and again nothing happened. And now the idea is if, if we had restra restraining orders at that moment, police would know what to do. Exactly. Uh, so it, it's an argument. Uh, it's not a very moral thing to say, but quite a few loud cases of crimes yeah. uh, has been helpful to us. I see. <laughs> they, they have promoted <coughs> the agenda. Make the debate come up again. Yeah. <coughs> but <coughs> without the previous educational work <coughs> on the part of NGOs and civic activists, these cases would have just been sensational crimes and nothing else with no legal consequences. I understand. You do the education Quite work first, and then something happens, uh, and then you can, you can cite it as an, as an example. Yeah. Yeah, super, super interesting. Look, you've been so. Do you feel? Do you? Are you? Are you afraid to speak so freely yourself? Uh, you, I'm I mean, no longer a member of Human Rights Council. Yeah. So the last restraint.